Hi, everybody. Welcome to our panel on underserved markets. I am joined by a fantastic group of people. And rather than me getting all stuffy with introductions, I'm going to ask you to tell us who you are, where you're from, and what brings you to this panel in particular. Kenya, you start. Okay, awesome. Uh, my name is Kenya Calderon. I am currently the Client Relations Director for Coopera Consulting. And I guess what brings me to, to this panel is not so much the work that, I, that I've done with Coopera, uh, but my experience as an immigrant credit union member and uh, how much credit unions, specifically in Iowa, have done for, for immigrant families like my own. We're going to get as specific as yes. Iowa. That is good. Good to know. Crystal. My name is Crystal Solomon. I'm a client business executive at Co-op Financial Services. And I partner with credit unions and really roll up my sleeves and get in and understand the nature of their business and understand their membership and help to identify strategies to where they can meet members' financial needs. And I'm located in Southern California. Great. Taylor. I'm Taylor Nelms. I'm the Senior Director of Research at the Filene Research Institute, which is a nonprofit think tank that does basic research and applied research on consumer issues as well as operational issues for consumer and cooperative finance. Uh, I think I was chosen for this panel to represent Gen Z, although that is inaccurate. I am definitely a millennial. Uh, so, but I'll be talking a little bit about Filene's research as well as um, the experiences of young people and, and other underserved markets, underserved populations for consumer financial services. Well, we will take you even though you're not Gen Z. Thank you. <laughs> Denali. Hi, my name is Denali Walden, and I was chosen for this panel to represent the LGBTQ community as a credit union member. I also serve on the supervisory committee of my credit union in Olympia, and so that's why I was chosen. Okay, fantastic. Taylor, since you hold um, the keys to the research, talk to me a little bit about um, millennials and Gen Z and the relationship that they have with money, particularly after the financial crisis. Yeah, that's a great question, Jean. I think, well, first of all, one big caveat is that I think generational segmentation can be overly broad. And so I think it's really important for us to think, perhaps not in terms of generations, but I like to think in terms of cohorts which really means focusing not on age per se, but on shared experiences. What are the shared experiences of different cohorts as they move through their life cycles, um, as they live in particular communities or move between particular communities, um, as they interact with one another and their family members and their jobs. So, you know, I think even in your question, I think you highlighted probably the biggest shared experience for most young people in the United States and really around the world, which is the the experience of going through a dramatic financial crisis, seeing um, you know, the rise in foreclosures, the spike in unemployment, um, and then the lingering effects of that crisis. And I think that you can see um, in young people's relationships with their money a variety of kind of echoes, right? And I think one of them has to do with the fact that even though many young people feel feel um, connected to their primary financial services provider, they are very distrustful of financial services generally, right? So even though you may see folks with high levels of trust with a singular institution, for the services, you know, for financial industry as a whole, I think there's a great deal of lingering distrust. And then there are, I think there are some macroeconomic challenges too that many young people face. Um, things around job insecurity, income volatility, uh, income and wealth inequality that are compounded by the many other communities and identities that they, that they have. The, the word distrustful, and, and you said this to me when we talked on the phone prior to this panel, I heard echoes of in all the conversations that I, that I had. Denali, I, I know um, from your experience there's not a lot of trust in financial institutions in general within the LBGTQ community. Can you talk about why? Absolutely. I think anytime you're serving a vulnerable population and also being a, a financial institution and in charge of people's money and walking in, they're already vulnerable just with their money. 
let alone the fact that they may be trans or they may be in a relationship with a same-sex partner or they may need uh, money for something that you that everybody may not be aware of. Maybe there's surgeries, you know, uh, gender-affirming surgeries or uh, planning for for parenthood, uh, things that may not be what every other person is coming in for, for financial reasons. So anytime you're serving that kind of population, I think um, trust is necessary. And so, yeah, I, I think that that's something that the LGBTQ community feels a lack of with their financial institutions, unless they've had training. And unless people have had the anti-oppression training, diversity training, use of pronouns, understanding mm -hmm. the system better. Well, we're going to get to the solutions sure. in just a second, oh, sure. but I want to, I do actually want to understand the problem okay. and how, um, mm -hmm. how universal it is. So Kenya, can I ask you to talk about the experience of the Latinx community as well as um, immigrants in general with financial services? Yes, and I, I love what you mentioned, Taylor, about the financial crisis and the, the mistrust that happened for younger, for uh, millennials, Gen Z, because they saw their parents go through that. And I think in the Latin X, the financial crisis is ongoing because we have uh, families who probably migrated um, here 20 years ago. And so maybe a, a colleague colleague of mine may not remember how their parents had to start from zero, or maybe they weren't around for that, um, but that mistrust, those uh, bad financial habits, they, they carry with them, and they, they, they want to improve their situation, but they don't know how. They don't have anyone that can show them um, how to, to start a CD, which is funny. I was having a conversation with my colleagues. They're all Latinx, and... I was telling him, like, because of the work that we do with credit unions, I was telling him, hey, I found out that there's a product such as CD, and we should look into it. And they're like, really, what is that? I was like, I don't know, but you all save, so we should probably get into it. So I think for us, the financial crisis is ongoing because of the uncertainty that we live in this country, whether you're documented or undocumented nothing seems to be guaranteed for us. Mm -hmm. So we often have to look for resources, not only for ourselves, but also for our parents, our grandparents. So I, I would say the Latinx, millennial, and Gen Z community connects very important resources to generations beyond ourselves. And yet, you have all found your ways to credit unions, which says to me, that credit unions are serving your needs, at least your specific credit unions. Crystal, talk about how credit unions are doing that in general. Well, the thing about credit unions is they are already a community-oriented organization. And so really the true heartbeat of what they do is people helping people. And so they have those relationships with the community already. Um, and they have a really good... Um, just layer of trust already within the community. And so they tend to provide products and services that are often um, easier to access than traditional financial institutions. And they also typically will charge lower fees, higher interest rates, um, and it's a community where your members are your owners of the credit union and so there is a sense of belonging within that and I think that as a um, as a starting point is very significant for credit unions. Um, they tend to get involved in select employee groups and sometimes those select employee groups are truly community organizations. So they are um, organizations that are already established with things like the Hispanic community, um, with organizations like the LGBTQ community. Um, and I know we'll talk a little bit about some of the solutions a little bit later, but um, credit unions do a great job of partnering with community and resources that are established. And um, they do a great job of um, having empathy 
when they do business. So they really try to understand the group that they're serving, and I think that's super important. Denali, you, um, you told me a story about your credit union and how there's a rainbow emblem right on the door. Yes. Um, and, and that st it stayed with me, I think, because it's a small thing, and yet it's so big. It's actually huge, and I think that's one of the successes of our credit union. They've done a lot of um, relationship building with the LGBTQ community, and they've done their own training. So they can then put a sticker that has a heart with the rainbow flag on it, saying it's a safer space for LGBTQ. And they've done lots of outreach. They show up at the Pride events. They give, they give money to PFLAG and to Pizza Clutch, which is an LGBTQ support group. So they, they definitely support LGBTQ members. How did you find your way to this credit union? Oh, many years ago, 21 years ago, in my 20s. And um, yeah, it was... It, it has a feeling of family, the, the imbued trust that they are definitely, they know me, they know my dog, they know my family. I, it's a very personal institution and it feels, it's very safe to be able to walk in there and be vulnerable with all of my financial you know, issues as well, so yeah. I know you got to your credit union at an extremely young age. Um, tell us the story. Yeah, so, I'd, so you mentioned how did we find our way to our credit union. I think my family didn't find our way to, to our credit union. Our credit union found their way to us. So uh, my parents had a really bad relationship with a bank, Wells Fargo to be specific. And they, <laughs> instead of helping our financial, institu uh, our financial situation, it worsened our situation with very high fees and when a family is starting over 15 to 30 dollars means a lot it means gas for the entire week it means being able to buy eggs and bread for breakfast and so they found us they find themselves they found themselves not trusting financial institutions. When, when was this, and what were your parents doing at the time? Yes, so we moved to the United States in 2005. So I wanna say this uh, negative experience happened probably in 2007. My parents were working two jobs each. My dad um, worked as a maintenance um, guy at McDonald's in the morning and then worked at a restaurant at night. My mom clean, was a housekeeper at a hotel and closed as a cook in, um, at night at McDonald's. So they, this lifestyle wasn't working for them. We couldn't see them. I was uh, 13, 14 at the time. My brother was 12. My little sister was nine, uh, 10. So we weren't seeing them. And that was not what we were used to in El Salvador. Plus, we needed parents around to raise us. And so, they knew that they needed to make a change. So they thought, let's start our own business. And that's how I became their business financial counselor at 14. And um, my aunt had already um, started building a relationship with a credit union that found her. And it was that credit union that was able to help them open an account and really start building that relationship with them and start building that trust with my parents. And um, as their financial counselor, I would go with them and interpret for them, even though I didn't need to because they had bilingual staff, mm -hmm. but the trust wasn't there quite yet, so I still needed to go in with them and advise them, even though I didn't know what I was talking about at 14. And it was, it was that credit union that really helped us by giving us the tools that we needed to start that business that same business is still active. They started a home improvement business. They worked together. And through that business, they were able to help me and my brother um, through college. He actually just graduated last weekend. Oh, congratulations. And thank you. Mm. And my little sister is a sophomore, so one more to go. <laughs> I think there's a really amazing insight just in the stories that we've heard here. And that's that credit unions are not only serving pre-existing communities, 
they're doing a lot of work to actually help build those communities, right? To invest in those communities. So it's not, like you said, Kenya, it's not just about individual consumers or households going and finding a credit union. It's credit unions doing their own outreach to actually you know, get involved in the community in a way that actually makes them vulnerable, right? And that's the foundation of trust, right? Is that kind of mutuality, right? In that relationship that happens between a household and an institution. What is, what is the research showing you about this community building? How, how successful is it? What, I mean, we talked about, when we talk about underserved markets, we sort of picked three of the biggest underserved markets you know, off the list, but there are so many others. How, how do you figure out what those markets are and what, what are you seeing? Well, I mean, I think first of all, uh, you have to do your research. And I'm not saying that just as a researcher, right? Um, you know, I, I, I don't think that you can jump into trying to serve a, a population that you already serve or uh, to do outreach to build your membership um, without knowing who they are and their needs. And, and that, you know, in that, in that process, the work of existing community organizations is crucially important. Um, and I think the most successful cases we have of credit unions doing outreach um, to serve underserved markets has to do with partnerships that they build with um, uh, those, organi those organizations and the investments that they make in those communities. Um, the second thing is I, I think that there's it's a, it's a multi-part process in adapting your organization to a new market, whether it's underserved or not. You obviously have to have the right products and services. Right. You have to adapt your operations, and then you have to build the soft skills, right? In other words, the reaching out to the underserved markets is also about going on your own diversity, equity, and inclusion journey, right? So it's about taking a hard look at yourself, your operations, your people, and making sure that you know, you've made the investments, right, to be able to do that. So it's really about uh, member compatibility. It's about building a fit between your offerings and operations and the needs and expectations of a consumer group. I, I want to touch on the two different ways you just talked about people, um, inside and reaching out. When it comes to building the teams inside, what I'm hearing is that we want to see ourselves in the staff of that credit union. We want to see ourselves in the employees. Crystal, you see a lot of credit unions. So can you talk about what's working? Yeah, absolutely. So I think a crucial component is to maybe think about hiring representation from each of those markets that you're trying to serve. Um, make sure that you have them like on a supervisory committee um, as Denali is and really kind of hone in on their experience. I know that um, I see a lot of clients that partner with, um, I know Filene does Bite of Reality. To me, that is such an impactful program because it puts people through a real life exercise of the struggle, mm -hmm. you know, of what it's like to live paycheck to paycheck. Um, it's important to talk about the issues um, and don't make assumptions, right? Because we all know what assuming does. And so uh, we talk about um, educating ourselves, um, doing research, partnering with credit unions, and um, not everything's going to work right out the gate. And so credit unions are not afraid to fail. Um, and that's the great thing about them is they will, they'll give it a good try. If it doesn't work, they'll go back to the drawing board and they, they typically don't give up either. So they will learn from their mistakes and kind of course correct and they'll go for it again. And so I think those credit unions that are um, consistent um, and genuine and actually show that genuine um, action um, and I know when, when we spoke, I, I mentioned that your actions and your words have to kind of meet at the same rate of speed. Yep. So you really have to meet your members where they are, really understand their lives and what they're trying to do, and just help them along the way. How has your credit union made an effort to understand your life? 
I think our credit union has done a unique job in having someone come in, do diversity training, do sensitivity training, uh, to learn all about how to to handle different situations and using again proper pronouns. It and is hard. The, yes, I mean, it, it can is, be. It's, it's difficult, and you you worry. I mean, I know I worry that I'm going to step all over myself and say the wrong thing and offend people all along the way. Well, and I think that that's a common feeling. And so I think educating ourselves, this is a time we are being tasked more than ever to check our own biases, to learn what we don't know. Um, and we don't know what we don't know sometimes. And so having, having kind of a model that comes in across the boards to financial institutions that addresses different anti-oppression trainings um, we'll cover those. And I think the more we, we delve in, the more we read, the more we learn, the more we pay attention, you know, echoing uh, Jose Andres, you know, we are, we, we the people, we're the people. And when we do look into our credit m members or credit union, the people who are working there, and we do see ourselves and their authenticity, and we can be authentic and be vulnerable with all that we are coming in with, um, you know, making no assumptions is, is a huge one. That was huge, definitely, Crystal. Um, so, yeah. How did your credit union, I'll come right to you, Kenya, how did your credit union train people in not making assumptions? They brought, in, they brought in diversity trainers. So we had people in the LGBTQ community come in and uh, do a diversity training. And there was hands outs and there was questions and people got to ask the really uncomfortable questions and said, well, I don't feel comfortable saying they, them. I don't understand it. That sounds like a plural. And people get to, you know, to explain to them why we use they, them and that we're not always binary and that, that um, you know, and there's lots of reasons people are choosing these, uh, these pronouns these days, and so just becoming aware and and recognizing that we are all we're all each other on some level. Yeah, Kenya. Yeah, I think it's about changing the norm, mm -hmm. right? It's about uh, because I have heard that before people don't want to offend someone. So, for example, in the Latino community, there's three terms that you can use right. to to define the community. Okay. We have Hispanic which millennials don't like to be called Hispanic, so some will get offended, right? Um, then we have Latino, which is I identify as Latina, and now we have Latinx, right? And it's about asking, how do you want to be identified? What, what do you prefer? And I think it's a simple question, and practice will make, will make you change your own norm. Um, so I, I think now in the Latinx community, we have I think we've always had a great deal of folks who want to be, who their pronouns are they, them. And at first, three years ago, that wasn't the norm for me. And it has become the norm. And I am very intentional about it, but that's because I've done the work. And, I've, and when I've made a mistake, I've acknowledged that I made a mistake, but not made a huge deal about it because yes. that also makes someone else uncomfortable. Just say, you know what, I'm sorry, and move on. And, and just do better later as well. And something I want to mention too about changing the norm and having a representation. So we want to reach new and underserved communities. We also want to hire them, right? Representation is extremely important. And to me, it needs to go beyond that. It's about having a plan to actually keep folks in the organization, mm -hmm. to do the work, to build an inclusive culture and to I want to see myself represented in the frontline staff, but also at an executive level. Most recently, one of the credit unions that I work with um, promoted a Latino to a vice president of development, business development and, and community, business and community development role. And that meant so much to me. And I called him up and I said, congratulations. Like, our community looks up to you, and I think that's, that's extremely important too, that our hiring practices reflect the community that we're trying to serve, mm -hmm. but also that our, that our promotions also reflect that as well, so that we just don't stay at bringing folks at the door, but we actually make sure that they stay with the organization and they move up through our organization. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna say that 
representation is important, but more important, I think, is authentic participation. Whether you're talking about the inside of your organization or your outreach into the community, it's not about the superficial face that you put out, right? It's about the material resources that you put at risk and your investments either internally or externally. People know when you're making an authentic investment, right? Um, and I think it's really important for credit unions, for all financial institutions, right, to make sure that um, their actions and their words line up. Right? Although, when it comes to optics, it's not that the optics don't matter, because the optics also matter, and they particularly matter to millennials and Gen Z, right? I, I know you've I've seen that in, in the data, that, that we, we want to be a customer of organizations that, that walk the talk. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, and I, I would just say that optics are an outcome, right? You don't start with optics. Optics right. is where you end up. Right. If you're making the, the right investments right, in your organizations as well as um, investments in the, the offerings that you have to your, your market, right, to your membership, um, the optics will be there. You know, the research does show us that um, young people in particular, but not only young people, right, um, really identify with institutions that are um, lining up their uh, organizational representation, right, with their own uh, representation of themselves, right? So, yes, people want to see themselves reflected, but I also think that it's just as important, if not more important, to make the investments to authentically get to the place where you're making that representation true. And if I may add, right now with the, with the talk about millennials and Gen Z, so I'm the only millennial in my house. My siblings are both Gen Z. And I know that because they have, so you can tell if they have YouTube downloaded on their phone. Because Gen Z. It's a good diagnosis. Right, right, because yeah. I don't. But <laughs> <laughs> um, And so for us, it's a very complex, I think, type of approach. Because yes, we want to see ourselves represented. But for me and my siblings, it's also important that a credit union can also serve my parents. So they don't necessarily have to have bilingual staff for me to feel comfortable, for me to do my transactions, but I need to know that I don't have to come in with my parents to help them, that they're actually making that investment too. And I think millennials in general pay attention to how business organizations are serving other marginalized communities or maybe other identities that don't really belong to me. So whenever I travel, I, I love to look for coffee shops. And one of the first things that I notice uh, that sometimes they will tell you if they have gender, gender neutral bathrooms in their location and whether that might not be needed for me as a Latina, but for someone else, I think that pushes me to, to go and invest in this business organization. I think that's what other folks are paying attention to when it comes to credit unions. Maybe I may be a white Latina, but I need to know that you're going to be treating someone else uh, the, the way that you would treat me, right? So just thinking about how complex this conversation can be and how many, so many different identities we need to, to be mindful of. And it sounds like a lot of work, but I don't think it's, it's, it's not. I think it's, it just, again, it becomes the norm and then you start to see the fruits of your, how intentional you are and how, how you will do, how you will do great things for the community, but also for your own organization. I mean, the needs are not dramatically different for any underserved population, right? They're underserved because they're not getting the resources and the products and services that the served populations mm -hmm. are, right? But the, the, the needs are, are fu fundamentally at least the same, right? It's about savings, it's about earning and spending tools, it's about borrowing, business you know, lending, right? Really important. Um, it's about planning and insurance, right? Those are the fundamentals of financial well-being. Those are the things that everyone needs. When Kenya alluded to this, and, and I'd like to explore it a little more, when we look at these underserved populations, populations that are underserved now, I mean, a lot of people would have put women in this category, maybe until very, very recently. Some people would still put women in this category. And yet, when you look at the trends, 
money is very quickly flowing into the hands of women. When we look at the Latinx population, if you look at people who have the ability to be upwardly mobile, to make a better life, when, when you look at those educational trends, the Hispanic population is moving, you know, is moving up. I would think that there is a really good business case for pursuing, um, for, for wanting to be the institutions of choice for these underserved populations. Um, Crystal, do you want to talk about that, or, or Taylor, either one? So, I think that um, basically what credit unions do, well, you talked about, you hit on women. Women, traditionally, <laughs> and this may be frowned upon, but traditionally women were the home takers. They were not the ones that went out into the workforce. Um, they typically relied on the men to bring home the bacon. And so I know in California, um, you almost need a two-income household to be able to um, survive out there. And so from my own personal experience, um, one of my first jobs was at a credit union. And um, the thing that really resonated with me the most was that it really was community, it really was inclusive, um, and it really promoted almost a female um, career path. Because if you look at the, the ratio of employees within the credit union industry, it is very high ratio of women that um, work in the credit union industry. And so they really helped to foster that within my own personal life. Um, and they really educated me on finances and they really invested in growing me personally. So as a, women, as a woman, that really resonated with me and helped to grow my career. And so within these different markets that we're talking about, um, the investment that credit unions make, um, it's not just um, putting out marketing materials, it's not even just um, diversity training and inclusion training, but is really putting their money where their mouth is. Um, it's hiring those folks and promoting them, um, and it is growing these membership bases with very distinct um, and authentic um, efforts. And so I think that credit unions do such a great job at um, focusing on financial planning. They do such a great job at um, really just they do a great job at really taking the emotional element of that and just pushing it forward. And it's not necessarily about the, um, the fiscal bottom line, right? It's really about the social impact and how they are reaching out to their communities. And that is almost just as important to them as their, their bottom line, is really how are we impacting these communities. I would also add you know, Jean, you asked about the, the, the business case, right? And I think that it's true, credit unions as nonprofits are attentive to the social impact, right? To the community, the, the possibilities for community transformation and investment. I would also say that there is a massive business opportunity. So you don't have to be altruistic, right? To serve an underserved right. market, right? Um, you can grow your revenue, grow your assets, grow your members. Um, by making these kinds of investments. I would also say that you have an opportunity here to serve members better that you already have. In other words, you know, we tend to think of underserved markets as being entirely outside of the financial system or entirely outside of even the credit union system. And that's not true. Many, many, many um, folks who would be categorized into an underserved market in one way or another are already credit union members. They're already at your institutions, right? Um, you can deepen that relationship in ways that um, has an impact and also you know, um, has an impact on your business, right? A positive impact on your business, um, just by serving them better. Um, oh, go ahead. Yes, I love that you bring up women in this topic. As a feminist, of course. Um, I see that in my household as well. So there's studies that show that 
actually recently, last month, that the future of the American economy is Latina women. And there's other studies, I think about two years ago, Google found that in a household, in a Latino household, Latinas are paying attention to their credit score a lot more than the men. But it's actually the men who have better credit scores because they actually are accessing checking account or accessing capital through loans. And so, and I even see that in my own household. I don't think my dad will get upset by saying this because it's true. But <laughs> my mom is the one that is always on track on making sure that all of the payments are made on time. Whereas my dad is a little bit more relaxed. He's like, oh yeah, we'll get to it. My mom was like, no, 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 no. It's due, we have to take care of it. And then I look at my sister and my brother, and my sister, she's the youngest, but she's the one that's the most mindful about checking her credit score every single time it gets reported, making sure that she's on payment with her, uh, with her, uh, with her credit card payment and such. So looking at this, I see how Latina women are being very intentional about their financial health, but at times they're still, if we look at the spectrum, are even more underserved than the men. Because when we think of business, we think of male entrepreneurs. But where is the space for female entrepreneurs in this conversation, right? So I think we need to even dig a little bit deeper into that segmentation about, yeah, let's serve Latinos, but who is still even more underserved under this community? And what type of financial tools can we provide them to make sure that we have Latina entrepreneurs uh, being successful because they are paying attention to their financial health at a higher rate than, than the men in our families, unfortunately. I'm sure my, he will not get mad at me for saying but it, that. But you know, it's also, you know, it's, it's about questioning what an entrepreneur looks like, right? Yeah. You know, are they male, are they female, are they LGBTQ or non-binary? But it's also about, you know, what does entrepreneurship look like? Right? Because it's not always the mom and pop store. Sometimes right. it is, often it is, and, and that's a massive part of um, economic growth. But it's also about independent work. It's about self-employment self online, right? Th that's, those are also forms of entrepreneurship that I think we need to pay attention to because they're a growing right. part of the economy. I, I, I think you're, you're very right, and I think when we talk about, um, on the panel earlier today at the, at the Think Convention, because the people who are watching this online are not all here. Um, uh, Brad Limer talked about um, basically plugging the holes that exist. And the generation that is growing up in the gig economy has a lot of holes, right? There's a, the whole employee benefits safety net is, is one big hole. And I would say that for right now, they too are an underserved population. You know, who, who steps in to provide the benefits framework for them? Can it be the credit unions? So we at Filene Research Institute have a new report that we just published <laughs> just last week about the effort of one particular credit union, Van City, up in Canada, um, that is doing a lot of work to out reach out to independent workers. Um, they are piloting two, um, they have two pilots that are ongoing. One is a small dollar lending product, um, and the other is, is a benefits product. Both are partnerships, I think, interestingly. One is with a... Um, a fintech that does uh, underwriting and, and risk, risk mitigation, risk management um, for small dollar loans. And the other one is with a cooperative um, health provider. Uh, and they're actually offering independent workers health insurance through the credit union. So yeah, I think there's a massive opportunity for credit unions to serve independent workers. One, one, one idea, right, that, um, that we've been batting around, and I think it's actually a really good one, is to transform the physical space of the credit union branch into a space that's welcoming for independent workers and entrepreneurs, right? To make it a co-working space, essentially. There's a lot of opportunities to think creatively about the resources that you already have to serve underserved populations like independent workers. As we um, start to wrap this up here, I, I would love your best advice for credit unions who would, credit unions that think they haven't gotten there quite yet, that would like to be more inclusive, that would like to, um, you know, be a model that can be talked about or at least serve their own community better. Tanali, let me start with you. 
I like the idea of what my credit union is doing, and they are doing the outreach directly, and they are going to the Pride events. However, if you're in, in a rural community that doesn't have that opportunity, I think that having some online presence, something that is letting people know in, in another way that um, this is an inclusive place, please come here with your, your needs, your money, your, um, and yeah, continue to, to do the work of, of training and continue to learn about all of these different areas to be able to serve them better. Yeah. I would say that, you know, if you're interested in, in any of these particular markets, right, um, you know, research partners and community organizations, that's the place to start. Um, you know, I'll just plug one other, you know, filing, um, bit of filing research that we actually did with, um, in cooperation with Guapera, um, which was around the products and services, lending products and services, in fact, that um, serve the needs of, of Latino and Latina communities around the United States. And one in particular, I think, has been very well validated to both plug a hole, as you put it, yeah. in, in um, small business lending in particular, um, and also be impactful on the bottom line of financial institutions, and that's I-10 lending, which is you know lending to folks who don't have a social security number. Um, so I think that there's great opportunities to learn more um, and you know start uh, start with your own research, start with the community, and um, you know build your up your expertise that way. Absolutely, you both brought up um, exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> but really, I mean, credit unions who educate themselves, who put themselves in the middle with these communities, spend time and invest time with them and really, truly get to know them. Um, ask the hard questions. Um, don't be afraid to ask the hard questions either because you don't know what you don't know. Um, and do not be afraid to invest in your marketing and your digital strategy to speak directly to the groups that you are trying to target. A great example is Pacoima Development Credit Union in California. Um, if you go to their website, it is completely focused on um, serving the Hispanic community. Um, and the neat thing about their website is there's just a little radio button at the very top where you can select English or Spanish. And that's not common on a lot of websites today. And so it's just little things like that that make it easier for people to do business with you is super important. So not only are you educating yourself, you're getting involved, you're putting these programs in place, but don't make it difficult for them to come in because there's a ton of um, institutions that are not traditional financial institutions that are winning these members business you go to Walmart you can get check cashing they're going to predatory payday lenders um, credit unions can serve a need at lower rates and develop relationships that will really just kind of carry that through into a membership environment and so credit unions are just really set up to win big with this and if they take the time to invest and, and really define a strategy, I think that will definitely speak volumes. I have three very simple points for credit unions. The first one is to acknowledge that by not taking a stand regarding your inclusive efforts, is taking a stand. It's being exclusive. It's being leaving out an entire population of your community. Second, to define who is your community. Because I can tell you, the community for credit unions is queer, is immigrants, is refugees. Communities for credit unions don't look the same, don't work in the same field at times. So it starts by defining who resides with you. And that, um, yesterday I was at a planning session in, in California, and that really resonated with me. Um, I asked, well, what do you want to be for your community? Or what are you trying to do? And they're like, we're just trying to serve who lives in our community, who is part of our community. And it's that simple, right? Mm -hmm. It's acknowledging that folks are going to come from all walks of life and that it's up to you to do the work, to, to make sure that they, they feel welcome at your branches, that they feel welcome and that they form part of your credit union community. And the third is ask for help. I think we have a great deal of partners. I think we have a great deal of resources in our industry that gives you the tools to be able to 
to start on this path to, to inclusivity, to, on this path of, of growth and uh, welcoming folks that are waiting to be served. Thank you, and thank you all for an amazing discussion. Denali, Taylor, Crystal, Kenya, um, I appreciate your participation and, and your thank advice. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you for thank having you. us. Yeah, sure. thank you.